All right, God bless everybody. Thanks for joining tonight. We, uh, we're going to continue on with the miracles of Jesus. We've been teaching for about eight weeks now. We did the parables, and uh, we transitioned over to the miracles, which is actually like a natural progression. So uh, we've gotten some really good Bible studies uh, on the miracles of Jesus, and so I'm looking forward to continuing um, tonight. So this, uh, this particular miracle that I'm talking uh, about tonight uh, it's like I, I think I mentioned it's familiar. It should be familiar if you've been reading the Bible for a while. Uh, but um, it's interesting on my Facebook feed, uh, I get memories that pop up and I'm, I think everybody probably gets those, uh, the memories. And so there was a memory maybe, I think it was last week. And the memory was of a revival that uh, we were a part of in Santa Rita jail. And so the, the chaplain at the time invited uh, us in, and uh, uh, quite a few people, but I believe our worship team might have went, and then a couple of our pastors went, and our leaders, and then they were from other churches too, but I believe we did some worship, and I got to go into the, what they call like the max uh, area, and so what the max area is, Santa Rita's, um, Santa Rita's a jail, it's not a prison, and so people there are only there for at a maximum of two years. It's not like the like a San Quentin type of a of a jail. Uh, Santa Quentin you call a prison, uh, Santa Rita you call a jail. So it's like lesser lesser offenses, and uh, for a shorter time. And then if you if you do a felony, you go to San Quentin anyway. They do have in Santa Rita. They this pod they call them pods, and they have the people who have done serious crimes or maybe are awaiting, uh, awaiting trial or awaiting sentencing or stuff like that. And they're, they're not as big group as the general population, but they're in there. And I think there was about, I don't know, 70 or 80 in there, maybe. And they wear a different colored jumpsuit, so you can even tell by the color that they're wearing that they're, uh, you know, they're different. They're in a different category, and I believe it says something different on the back. But I remember uh, that that was like the, the hardest group in the jail. Uh, this is like the, the more serious crimes. And I was in there with two other people. And they all had their own cell and they came out. And I remember they just, they just seemed different, you know, than the general, cause we had done stuff with the general population too. And I remember they just seemed different, more, more, uh, more somber, more serious. And so, uh, there's not a lot of reaction. I remember being in the general population, there was a lot of reaction, uh, even kind of participation, uh, at times, uh, some better than others, but I remember being in this group and we had a deputy in there that was unarmed. And so I remember being in there and praying. I was, while I prayed, of course, obviously I prayed because I was going to be speaking in there. Uh, but I remember also praying because there was a lot, there was, almost all of them came out, like 70 or 80 of them. And they were all serious. And we just had one deputy in there with no gun. And so I remember, I remember having this kind of, um, this kind of, this battle, internal battle, like, you know, I felt like the enemy was trying to, trying to cause me to fear. And I was like, no, God sent me here. Uh, I, God did not give me, I was quoting scripture. God did not give me a spirit to fear again, but a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. So anyway, when I was in that pod that day, I actually uh, preached on um, this miracle that I'm going to be teaching about today. So just an interesting connection that I made, uh, that this memory just came up. I, I was planning on teaching this. And then I remembered I preached on this same miracle uh, back in Santa Rita about nine years ago, right around this time of the year too. So just an interesting note. So I want to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles tonight. Again, thank you for joining me. I encourage you to participate, uh, write comments, like, love. Uh, anything stands out to you, you write it in the, in the comments. That's a good way to remember and just interact and just let me know what, uh, what things are standing out to you as well. Uh, this, is a, this is a really great miracle. It's found in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So you know there's some significance there. It was a pretty impactful miracle if all three of them wrote about it. But I want to I read the text, and then I want to pray, and then we'll get into the, the miracle for today. We'll get into some details. So let's go to Luke chapter 8, starting with verse 26, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Luke, Luke, the gospel of Luke, chapter 8. So these are the miracles of Jesus. So we're going to talk about the miracles of Jesus. They would be found in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. So this particular miracle was found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
and there are some minor differences that I'll just mention briefly. But Luke chapter 8, verse 26 through 39, let's read it together. And it says, uh, Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain, so they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who had fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. When they had went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, they were afraid. So look, look at the man, uh, this man who was possessed by demons that was naked, cutting himself out in the tombs. Uh, when the people came after Jesus had commanded the, the, the spirits to leave him and go into the swine, it says, when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And it says they were afraid. They also who had seen it told them by what means he had done, by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. So listen, he was demon-possessed and it says he was healed. That's interesting. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And he got into the boat and returned. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Did you catch that? It says, go tell, go tell what great things God has done for you. And then it says that he went and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. He said, go tell what God has done. It says he went out and said what Jesus, uh, what Jesus had done. Je equating Jesus again with God. It's always good to, to, uh, to see that uh, pointed out in the scriptures. Go tell what God has done. And then he went and told what Jesus had done. Same thing. Jesus is God. Amen. So let's pray. Uh, let's, uh, let's dig into this miracle a little bit. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. We give you the glory and the honor. We're so grateful uh, for your word. Uh, we're thankful for this time and the, and the teachings of the miracles of Jesus. There's just so much to glean. Uh, the thing that, that just stands out to me as we go through the miracles is that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You did it then. You'll do it now. You still are in, you still are in the healing business. You're still, in the, you're still in the business of doing miracles. You're still saving. You're still healing. You're still restoring. And so we thank you, Lord, for what, what, uh, what we learned from this, from this uh, story, from this miracle, is, uh, Lord, how much you love us. And uh, that your power is greater than any other power, Lord. And we thank you for this, this testimony and this uh, example of this life that was tormented. And then, Lord, you set him free for your glory. So be with us tonight. We pray for uh, illumination of your word that leads to revelation, which results in transformation of our lives for your glory. Be with us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a, this is a really good chapter in the book of Luke. And so immediately before the story, immediately preceding this story of uh, what is known, what this man was known as a, a demoniac, Jesus told the disciples uh, right before, in the story right before, if you read it in the chapter, giving you some context, Jesus tells the disciples to get into the boat and go to the other side. While they're in the boat, Jesus falls asleep and a humongous storm hits the, the, the sea and it threatens to drown them. And they cried out, Master, Master, we are perishing. Jesus wakes up. Jesus rebukes the storm and it calms down. 
And then he rebukes the disciples and he says to them, uh, where's your faith? And they said, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And they worshiped him. Uh, so this story of the demoniac, the, the, also known as the Gadarene, this story is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew actually mentions in his version, he mentions two demoniacs, or two men in a similar condition out in the tombs, out in the Gadarene region. Mark and Luke only mention one. I mentioned last time that uh, also when I taught on Bartimaeus that uh, the other authors mentioned two blind men, whereas Matthew only mentions one. And so there, there's, there can seem to be a contradiction. There are people who are, who are looking for contradictions in the Bible. And it's, since the very beginning, people look for contradiction. There can be a seeming contradiction, but there's actually not. So there's two demon-possessed men out there, uh, but it's likely that one stood out more than the other. Just like with Bartimaeus, he was probably the louder of the two. So if there was two, then obviously there was one. So if there's two, there's one. So uh, Matthew was a tax collector, so he's a person who deals more with numbers and details. So he, he is a numbers guy, so he puts uh, there was two uh, demon-possessed men out there, whereas Mark and Luke probably or just focusing on the one who stood out when they tell their stories. So uh, there's the, the one that we're talking about in Luke is likely the one with the stronger personality. So for this reason, Mark and Luke only mention one. So Matthew was a tax collector and a numbers man, so that's why he mentions two. Remember, if there's two, there's one. So they sailed in the boat to what Jesus says to the other side. They sailed to the, the country of the Gadarenes. Uh, which is opposite Galilee. So directly across from Galilee, across the sea, or it's really the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, but it's really just a big lake. Uh, they go to the exact opposite side of Galilee, where Jesus lived. And so when they go there, uh, this it's not just opposite geographically, but it's, it's opposite in every way. It's opposite geographically. It's opposite culturally. It's opposite socially, economically. And spiritually, it's a whole nother, it's a whole nother world on the opposite side. And the reason that is, is because the area, the region of the Gadarenes is actually a Gentile, it's a Gentile territory, Gentile environment predominantly. So this was, and this was in Jesus's ministry, after he started his ministry at 30, this is actually his only uh, trip into a Gentile territory. He had gone through Samaria which are half Jews, uh, half Gentiles. But this is his only trip that he makes that, that's recorded uh, to the Gentile territory in the area of the Gadarenes. So in the, in, as we read the story, as we read it, you probably have to you know, read it a couple times, a few times, to kind of, get, to kind of uh, let some things stand out to you. In the story, there's this heightened emphasis, as we read it, there's this heightened emphasis on the unclean. There's a man with the unclean spirit, he, uh, there's this man lives in the tombs, which is kind of a, a, a like a dark place. It'd be like somebody living at the cemetery or something like that. Uh, there's a there's a source of impurity. Like as Jewish people read this story, there's like pigs around, and so that's another source of impurity. And of course, he's a Gentile, uh, considered uh, impure, and so there's there's all these things around where Jesus goes, where all these things are considered impure. Demon-possessed man out in the tombs or out like in a cemetery area. There's pig around, there's Gentiles around. And so there's a lot of emphasis on the unclean. And yet Jesus still goes there. Now, the what's the purpose of this trip? What's uh, As we read the story, if we look and we try to de and we decipher, just try to discover what Jesus was doing uh, in this in this story, and when he does this miracle, what's he doing? Like, what's the purpose? Did, like, when he uh, when he went through Samaria, he was heading he was heading north to to Galilee, to the uh, area of Galilee. Uh, but what was his purpose for going here? Why was he going to a Gentile territory? And really, as we read it, we figure out that actually the reason Jesus goes there was to set a demon, a Gentile demon man, uh, demon possessed man free. So he, he actually, this trip, there's no other reason that other than Jesus went there to set this man free. No other activities recorded in the region. Jesus didn't just decide to start preaching everywhere. Uh, no, he went over there, he set this man free, and then he went back. He went home. So what, we're, what we see here is that Jesus actually went out of his way to set this man free. 
Isn't isn't that so uh, isn't that so beautiful? I think that's just so wonderful. There's a story. Jesus goes opposite uh, the opposite direction of where he where he lives. He goes to a Gentile region, and the only reason that we know that he went there is he goes there. He sets this man who's tormented. Uh, constantly, daily, day in, day out for uh, Lord knows how long. And he goes there, just sets the man free, and then he goes back to where he came from. So the whole purpose of this trip was to set a demon-possessed man, uh, man free. And, and isn't that just the way the Lord is? Jesus will go out of his way. Uh, to, he'll step into your situation. He'll step into your circumstance. He'll step into your problem, your dysfunction, your addiction, your sickness. He'll step into your troubled marriage. He'll go out of his way to step into your, into your territory and just to bless you, to heal you, to deliver you, and set you free. I think that's a good time to say amen. He'll, he'll step right into your situation, into your territory, just so he can turn your life around for his glory. That's what Jesus does. He'll, he'll go out of his way to do something in our lives. He's such a good God. And so he'll go to places that you never would even think he'd go. Like the, the, the least likely place to find a Jewish man is in a Gentile region full of pigs and demon-possessed people uh, living in the tombs uh, that are naked. And that's the, like the least likely place for a Jewish man to go. Yet he, Jesus went there, and he went there for the sole purpose of setting the man free. Jesus will go to places that people are least that people will think uh, would be the uh, last place people uh, that Jesus would go. And some people think that the only place God will go or Jesus will go is church, but that's not true. There's no place that the Lord won't go to reach somebody, save somebody, heal somebody, set somebody free. There's no place the Lord won't go. There's not, there's not one place uh, in this world that the arm of the Lord cannot reach. There's no place he's not willing to go to find you, to rescue you, to deliver you. There's no place, Jesus, there's no place that you can go where you can escape the love of God. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've gone, who you've done it with. It doesn't matter how long you've done it. There's still no place and nothing you can do that will disqualify you from the love of God and from Jesus finding you and delivering you and set you free. He'll go to any length to reach you with his love and deliver you from with his power and save you. You. Listen, Jesus will go into a dysfunctional home. Uh, Jesus will, has gone into bars. Jesus will go into a crack house. He'll go into a jail cell. He'll go into the gutter to reach you if that's where he has to go find you. Jesus will go out of his way to places you would never think of just to rescue and deliver you. And the reason he'll do that is because he loves you so much. There's, there's no place, no one, and there's no place and there's no one that is beyond the reach of Jesus. There's nobody beyond his reach. I think that's a good time to say amen. And so Jesus crosses to the other side, complete opposite geographically and in every other way. The least likely place a Jewish man will go, but Jesus goes there with that purpose. And so when Jesus gets there, he steps out onto the land and he's met by this man. He's met by this man who was demon possessed. And this man was uncontrollable. Uh, you liter literally, he was out of his mind. And he was naked, he had no clothes on, he was homeless, he lived in the tombs, he was destructive. He was self-destructive. He literally was cutting himself. Uh, I know there's uh, that people will do that, uh, they'll self-harm, they'll, they'll cut themselves, uh, even now today. But this phenomenon has been around for much longer, even in this time, this man is cutting himself. And he's out of control. And so they put him, they, he had to go live in some tombs. He was chained out in those tombs like a wild animal. And these uh, evil forces that lived inside of him were, were so overpowering that even, uh, even though they chained him, he would break the chains and they'd have to rechain him uh, over and over again. But the, 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 the beautiful part of the story is that when Jesus gets there is that the chains that bound, that bound, uh, that bound his soul because that was the greater bondage that he was experiencing, not the physical ones, but the spiritual ones, the chains that bound, bound his soul would, could be only be broken by one greater than the one binding him. And that one did come, and his name is Jesus. So the, so the enemy, the devil, was binding his soul, and he's demon-possessed, and his soul is bound. He's physically bound because he's so inwardly bound. And then the only, there's only one person that can unbind him, and that person was there, and his name is Jesus. And so it doesn't matter what situation in, how bound you are, how, how, uh, how oppressed you are. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with. Uh, if you feel bound in any way, uh, Jesus has, has the power to set you free. It doesn't matter what you're faced with right now. And so this man, this Gadarene man that was demon-possessed, he had, he, had, he had 
he had gone so far. He was so far gone that he crossed, uh, he crossed over a long time ago the lines of human decency. He was completely displaced from his community. He's living among tombs. So that's like outside of the town where people lived. He's living, uh, he's living out in the tombs. And in, in many ways, he could be described as somebody, and I'm sure people would have said of him, he might as well be dead because he's not with his family. He's not with friends. He's not even among people. He's not among his community. He's, he's, he's tormented inwardly. He's, he's uh, being self-destructive. He's homeless. He's naked. He's out there. Uh, he's, he's breaking chains. He's chained up like a wild animal uh, because he's so dangerous to others and to himself. And so he might as well be dead in a lot of ways is something that they would say about him. But as the scene develops in the story and Jesus shows up, this actually turns out to be a, an encounter of cosmic proportions. It's really just greater than uh, a man, two men coming together, Jesus and, and this man. It's something much greater going on here. It's a, it's a cosmic encounter be, between Christ and the devil. And so this story is the most detailed that we'll find in, in the New Testament and in the, in the, in the Gospels. It's the most deta detailed story that we find about the destructive effects of demon possession, and, and it, but it also provides a strong expression uh, of the power of Jesus against the force of evil. So yes, there's detail and it shows... Uh, it shows a lot of what uh, it's a lot more detail than we're used to the destructive effects of demon possession. But even but more importantly than that, it, again, it shows us yet the power of Jesus is even greater. So don't ever don't ever uh, feel afraid. Don't ever feel like uh, like if something like something like this happens to someone that they're they're beyond reach. No, uh, no matter what the enemy does, no matter how how strongly he may affect somebody's life. Uh, even to the point of demon possession, just know that when Jesus encountered this man who had not just one demon but uh, many demons, he, when he encountered him, it, it was actually no, it was no, there wasn't even a struggle. Jesus, uh, Jesus easily uh, dominates these uh, demons inside of this man and sets this man free. So it's the, it's uh, the, what what looks like a, a strong possession of a man, Jesus shows up and the strong expression yet of the power of Jesus is demonstrated against these forces of evil. So just know that the Christ in us is greater than he who is in the world. And so the demon inside of the man is called an unclean spirit or there are unclean spirits. And I just want to clarify that any spirit that isn't the Holy Spirit is an unclean spirit. Any spirit that isn't the Holy Spirit is an unclean spirit. We should not be messing with spirits. We should not be messing with demons. We should not be messing with Ouija boards or with uh, any other kind of uh, summoning of uh, anything uh, dark or any other uh, any other kind of spirit. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody's clear that there's, there's the only spirit we want to deal with is Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us once we come to faith in Christ. I think that's a good time to say amen. And so there's no, I just want to, I just want to be clear. We should not be messing with anything other than, than uh, we should not be, I don't say messing with, dealing with uh, any spirits. The only spirit we're concerned with is Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us. So I want to be clear in that there are no good witches. There's no good witches. Some people say there's good witches and bad witches, white witches and black witches. Uh, there's no good witches. There's no, no good witches. There is no white magic. Any kind of power outside of the power of God is not, is not good power. It's not white power. It's not white magic. It doesn't mean it's good. No, it, it's coming from another place. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it white. You can call it anything else. Uh, if, it's not, if it's not directly from God, if it, then it's, it can only come from another place, and that's darkness. And so we don't want to be messing with any of that. Uh, there's no karma. There's no, there's no uh, kind of just power that pays you back, you know, later. No, uh, when the only, the only, uh, thing we worry about when we, when we do something outside of God's order, when we sin against the Lord or somebody else, uh, we repent 
And once we repent, we're forgiven. So there's no, God doesn't go, I know you repented and I know I forgave you, but you know what? Uh, actually, I think I'm going to make something bad happen to you to pay you back for what you did before. No, there's something that's provided to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's repentance. And once we repent, our sins are forgiven. There's nothing going to come back and pay us later. Uh, Jesus took it on the cross and our, our sins are, to are tossed into the deepest part of the sea, never to be remembered again. So there's no karma there's no reincarnation. Uh, there's no positive energy. I cannot send positive energy your way. I don't have that kind of energy or power to send to you. What I could do is I can pray for you and ask that almighty God, the only God, will send his blessing. He'll send his strength, power, whatever you need to your life and reveal himself that you might give him glory. But there's no other, there's nothing, there's no positive energy that we send to each other uh, and not to mention all the other false gods and false religions. Uh, that's exactly what they are. They're false. There's one true God. The Bible makes it very clear in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God. It doesn't say in the beginning, gods. There's not many gods, multiple gods. Uh, every other god is a so-called god. There's only one true and living God. And he created everything. He created us. And he's the only spirit uh, that we will deal with. He's, he's God Almighty. And so we deal with him. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. No other spirits we should be dealing with. And the spirit that lives within us will dominate any other spirit, any spirit that comes from darkness or any place else. And so I just want to make sure we're clear on that. And the God in us is greater. So back to the man in the story. The man in the story is reached. Really, man, when we read the story, it's really, if you, if you read it slowly and absorb it, which I have done, uh, this, this guy that's demon-possessed has really reached a really, about a really low place, about as low as a person can get. And the truth is, is anyone that lives their life without Jesus, without, that lives their life without Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, has the potential to sink really, really low and sink, sink to depths that they cannot imagine because what's to stop them, right? I'm not saying everybody does. Not, I'm not saying if you don't have Jesus, this isn't some kind of veiled threat. I'm not saying if you, Jesus Christ isn't your Lord and Savior yet. I believe he will be one day if he's not right now. I'm not saying you're going to sink this low. But I'm saying is there's a potential if somebody doesn't have God in their life, what's to stop them from sinking lower and lower? I know most people don't get to this place, but the potential is always there for somebody to sink lower or at least lower than they could ever imagine because they don't have God in their life. Uh, what's, what's to stop, right? Right now, Holy Spirit, uh, us as children of God, Holy Spirit lives inside of us. He's there convicting. He's challenging. He's reminding us. There's a people that he sends people of God to us. He's, al he's always reaching for us. He's always trying to reconcile us back to him. He's constantly guiding. When Holy Spirit lives in us, at least there's, there's the, we have the spiritual interactions of the Holy Spirit. But what about a person? Like I think um, even during this pandemic time, I've thought, I don't know how people can do it without Christ in their life. I don't, I don't know how you can go through these difficult times in life with really no hope or no strength because I've seen God um, help so many as a pastor. I, we just did a funeral last weekend. I did a couple during the, uh, we did it outside. We did a couple others outside. I did three uh, here at the church in the parking lot over the, over the pandemic so far. Um, all of course within the rules that were permissible. But, um, and I just thought, you know, the, all the families were all believers. And so they had strength and they, and they even hope. And I just thought, I don't, having done so many funerals over the years, I just often wonder, I like, how do people even do it without Christ? I, I, I just can't even imagine, um, like, what's to look forward to? What, where's the hope uh, without Christ? And so uh, even during this pandemic, Christ has provided so much hope and given so much strength and blessing because, um, because we have a relationship with God and Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And so it's so important that we have that relationship, we maintain it, because without him, life is so difficult, and we can't sink to places we never imagined. So, um, but we have the Holy Spirit inside us to lead us, guide us into all truth, and lead us back to the Father who will, uh, who will keep us, protect us, and su supply all of our needs. So back to the story. When Jesus steps off the boat, this man who's demon-possessed, the Gadarene man, he 
falls. I mean, as soon as Jesus steps foot on ground, he falls at the feet of Jesus. He just, he just falls there before him. And Jesus asked the, the, the man uh, a question. He says, what's your name? And I don't necessarily believe Jesus didn't do this every time he encountered a demon-possessed person. He was like, hey, um, what's your name? He didn't ask that question uh, to every demon-possessed person he encountered. He usually just went right in and just, just uh, cast them out. Uh, for some reason, he asked the name uh, in this encounter. And I believe it was maybe more for us than necessarily because Jesus wanted to know. Obviously, he's uh, omniscient, so he knows everything. He doesn't need to ask anybody their name. He doesn't need to ask a demon his name. Uh, this isn't really a dialogue between Jesus and demons. There's no need for that. Uh, Jesus usually just goes in and, 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 and takes authority. But he asked the guy his name, and I think he asked him because there's some real, there's some real uh, truth to glean from, the, from what he hears. So the man, the man or the, 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 the demon inside of him replies, uh, my name is Legion, which uh, a legion there, and in the time of Christ, there was legions of soldiers, Roman soldiers, which, it, which kind of by implication, what, what, what's coming out of the man is that he's, the, the demon inside of the man is saying uh, that a whole regiment of demons had entered, had entered him, had entered into the man. And so a Roman legion was 6,000 soldiers. And so I don't know if there were 6,000 demons necessarily inside the man, but what he definitely is saying that there's a lot inside of him. So the word legion, uh, Roman legion, the legion was 6,000 soldiers. So he's definitely saying that there was a lot of demons that had entered him. Now, here's an, there's another, it's kind of another reason why he might be called legion which is uh what i kind of lean towards i think i believe there's more than one for sure but i don't believe there were six thousand but i believe the the legion the reason the name is revealed and and perhaps the more compelling reason to me anyway is the the name legion is that uh, there's a, a ref there's that reference to roman legions and that maybe perhaps uh, there was some kind of traumatic experience with roman soldiers that had passed through that region. And so that's where, uh, that's where kind of this whole uh, downward spiral of this man's, you know, uh, maybe he had uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, perhaps uh, some other violent things were done to him. I mean, those soldiers were actually pretty brutal uh, soldiers. And so they could have, you know, they could have done a lot of things to him to harm him in, in many different ways. And uh, after they perhaps maybe did something uh, like brutalize him, uh, do something to him or his fa and his family or something like that, that he, he was traumatized. And this kind of opens the door uh, for, uh, for this uh, demon possession. Uh, that's, that's another possibility that maybe it was just Roman soldiers passing through and traumatizing him in some way. And now he's kind of left in this, in this bad uh, place. And then to further, he sinks further down and he's now in, finds himself in this condition. And so, um, you know, uh, that's, again, that's kind of on the g getting pretty lows, lows, pretty, pretty lows you can get in, in a lot of ways. Um, most people don't get to that place necessarily. I mean, that's pretty extreme, pretty, uh, pretty dramatic and traumatic. Uh, but there are people even, even that are listening, and maybe we'll listen later, uh, that have gone through some pretty traumatic uh, experiences in their life. And they've had a negative effect on you. And maybe to the point where you can't even seem to shake it off. I've met plenty of uh, good, solid, faithful Christians uh, that serve the Lord. I love the Lord. They're, obviously, they, they're saved. They have a relationship. But they still, still seem to have uh, difficulty maybe breaking through or, or going further in the Lord or, or things like that. And a lot of times what, what happens is, is they've been through traumatic things. And so it, it will, it, as much as God has done in so many lives, even people who've gone through traumatic experiences, a lot of times in childhood, 
it still seems to maybe block, block their, their, uh, their emotional health and their spiritual health or, or growth. And that's not to throw stones at anybody. And we live in a fallen world. We have all been through some hard things, traumatic things. I personally, um, I, I mean, I have some traumatic things that, I, that I've gone through. And uh, so I, I, I definitely know. Uh, but it can affect our trust. It can affect, um, you know, just different parts of our life. It depends, you know, what, where, the, where it occurred, what occurred, things like that, what part of your life it occurred in. It could all have different effects. And then, of course, the individual. Every person is different. There's some people that go through traumatic things, and, 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 it, and you see them just uh, overcome. And they, to them, through them, it, it seems like they got through it uh, somehow, and where other people, maybe they didn't. And you can see the effect as well. And so that's, that's to say that we all have gone through traumatic things. And it affected us, but as we as we uh, as we walk, you know, walk in this journey of faith with the Lord, uh, we constantly have to give it, give up, and surrender our hearts. And I know there's always be a time, uh, eventually in our lives, where uh, if we're pressing in and we're seeking God's face and we're spending time with Him and we're, we're reading His Word and we're uh, we're sp- you know spending time in His presence, if, we, if we're really pursuing a constant. Uh, consistent relationship with God, a healthy relationship with God. At some point, God will, God will begin to deal with these things in our hearts and really uh, do things like uh, lead us into forgiveness and, and lead us into other, other things that will uh, help us uh, to, to, to uh, forgive, which will lead to health and go forward. And it's not to minimize what's happened to anybody, obviously, uh, but it's, I know God will even, and he'll do that so he can bring healing. Ultimately, what God is looking to do in our lives is to heal us and you remember, as we read, I pointed out that it said he, he, he set the man free, but ultimately he was healed. This man was, so you would think, well, this man's demon possessed, uh, but then the story says he was healed. So uh, there's, that's why I, we believe, and, and I believe that based on the Greek and things like that, that this man was probably traumatized, and, and, a, and because of the, the traumatic state he was, found himself in, seems much worse than, like, let's say something, you know, something, let's say, uh, I don't want to say normal people go through. I don't want to call it traumatic experiences normal, but it seems to be heavier than, than what we're kind of accustomed to seeing. There's some things you hear and you go, oh, and you, you realize that happens more frequently, unfortunately, than we'd like to believe. Uh, but then there's some things that are a lot worse. Like I'm saying, maybe a, reg- a Roman legion might have gone through and did some pretty, uh, pretty brutal things. So anyway, um, God will ultimately want to heal us. He'll want to heal us of, of, of the things that have traumatized us in our past. And he wants to make us whole. He wants to heal us. And he wants to, he wants to uh, lead us and, and, and shape us and mold us into the person he created us to be. But there has to be at some point uh, an encounter with God and uh, uh, surrendering to God to let him, again, deal with that area in our heart, our life, maybe in our emotions, um, uh, in our past. And there's, a, there's definitely a, a value in that when God heals and you can move forward and you feel a freedom. And I think all of us need that. Uh, all of us need that on some level. I believe we all need that. I kind of look at my, my walk with the Lord. Like I said, I, 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 just like I'm sure everybody, well, I know everybody. I'm, there's no doubt, um, a doubt in my mind that most people and all on some level deal with traumatic stuff. Uh, at some point in their lives, a lot of times the childhood. But I remember the Lord, I was studying Luke 19, and uh, Pastor Jackie actually taught on this miracle. Luke 19 is one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite miracles is the 10 lepers. Uh, they were standing afar off like they're supposed to, and they see Jesus, and they say, Jesus, uh, heal us. Jesus sends them to the high priest, and uh, one comes. So it says they, well, the point is, they, they, it says, the scripture says in Luke 19, that they were healed as they went. They were healed as they went. And so on the way to the high priest, so they're being obedient to Jesus. You weren't supposed to go show yourself to the high priest until you saw that you were healed. And so they weren't healed yet, but because Jesus said, go show yourself, which is a sign of being healed, though they weren't healed yet, they went. And at, because they were obedient to the word of God, as they went, they were healed. And so when one realized that he was healed, he actually turned around and came back to Jesus to thank him. And so I remember studying that, that passage one, one day, years ago now. And I remember the Lord kind of explaining to me, because you know, I've seen um, in services and things like that, uh, people get healed like dramatically 
uh, in a service at an altar through prayer. We've seen you know different demonstrations of the power of God, but I've seen many people over the years be healed at an altar. I mean, beautiful things. And I remember the Lord kind of speaking to my heart in that scripture saying, that's what I've done with you. I've healed you as you went. A lot of things in my life, uh, God healed just as I went. And I wasn't really, even as I went, I, I'm, I kind of didn't notice right away. And then as I look back and go, oh, I can, I can realize that there's different things in my life that, uh, that had affected me and I still carried them uh, over into my walk with the Lord. And so right, you know what I mean, right? So let's say you're an angry man. Well, because I was an angry man, so I'm going to use that example. So I was an angry man, even as, young, as a young man, I was an angry man. And so then one day Jesus like saves me, like dramatically, I mean dramatically saves me. And I, I, from one day to the next, it was, it was just crazy. On an altar call on a Sunday night, God saves me dramatically. It was crazy. It was like just a, an, an encounter. God speaks to me. And he breaks down my defenses and he saves me. I wept for a half hour as I repented, as I realized that God was real and that I had sinned against him. And when I realized that God loved me and that what I was doing was, was you know, uh, was against God and, and hurtful to a loving father who sent his son to die for me. When I realized all that in that moment, I, was, I just, w just went to my knees and I wept at an altar for a half hour. And when I got up, I was different. I was lighter. I felt forgiven. And I realized that God loved me. And I thought God was mad at me because of my sin. I knew I was a sinner. I just thought that God was mad at me and I was never going to be able to live up to God's expectations. And that moment, I realized God loved me and that what I was doing actually affected him and that it hurt him uh, to the point where he had to send a son. And so I did. I got up and I was different and I've never been the same. That's a good, that's a good time to say amen. And God is good. I, and I needed an encounter like that. And God broke down my defenses and spoke to me. And so, but after I got up, I did feel clean. I remember now having this conviction of the Holy Spirit. I was, so the big change in me was like, I was now hungry for God. So I wanted to go to church. Now I, I didn't like going to church before I went reluctantly uh, and, but now after the encounter with Christ, I now wanted to go. I wanted to know God. I wanted to read his word. I wanted to, now the worship songs, which I kind of just sat there and listened to. Now, all of a sudden I was joining in and I wanted to, and when I did, when I, when I made my really meager, humble attempts to worship God in the, in the services, uh, now I felt the presence of God and, and I was getting hungry. I was reading my Bible and I just wanted to know and I wanted to learn and I wanted to, I wanted to, to be who I was supposed to be. And it was, it was really, really beautiful. But I was, but what I, my point is this, I still had anger. As much as I love God, I was now hungry for God. I was now worshiping. I was now reading my Bible. I still wanted to go to service. I wanted to be prayed for. I wanted to learn how to pray. All those things. I was hungry. I was just hungry for God. I still was angry though. And I still dealt with anger. And I had other things that I, that I, went, that I was dealing with before I went saved, before I was saved. And now I was still dealing with them in a sense, but now I was aware of them and I wanted God to cleanse me from them now, but I still had anger and I still had other issues. And so I carried them into my salvation. And then through, through God's patience, gentle and loving patience, he, through his word, he would wash and cleanse my mind and my heart. He was washing me with the water of his word, Holy Spirit, taking the word of God and sanctifying me with it. And then ultimately those things began to go away. And so a lot of things, and I was angry for a certain reason. I had addiction issues. I had other issues. Uh, I carried them in because of my childhood and other things that had happened to me. And I've been exposed to uh, things, you know, things that were, were contrary to the ways of God. And so as I went, God healed me. Some things God, God delivered me from immediately. Like I was, I was alcoholic. I drank constantly every day, all the time uh, for years and years and years. I spent a lot of time in addiction. Uh, God healed me from addiction instantly. That night at the altar that I described, that night I never did another drug. I never did another alcohol. I never did any of that stuff instantly. Uh, my profanity, I was in the military. I ran around in the streets uh, before I, as, a, as a young man. Uh, now all of a sudden profanity, like I didn't want to, I, didn't, I knew like I couldn't talk that way as a child of God. And I just understood, there's some things that God allowed me to understand. And he took those things from me immediately. I didn't cuss anymore. I didn't drink anymore. I didn't do drugs anymore. I didn't do any of that stuff. But there's still anger. There's still some things deep inside of my heart because of the things I'd been through, the way I, you know, the things that I dealt with growing up. And so uh, slowly and patiently, God began to deal with those things. And so I could say, as I look back, um, 
that God healed me as I went. So that's, and I look back and I said, I said, oh, wow, that's a, actually uh, feels like an accurate description of what God did in me. So I, I encourage you, like, don't, don't be discouraged. Just keep, just keep, uh, keep seeking God, you know, reading the word, going to church, and you'll just be amazed as how God will cleanse you and then heal you as you go. You look back after a few years of serving the Lord, you'll realize, man, I don't do that anymore, and I don't do that anymore, and I'm sin that sin's no longer a part of my life, and I don't do this, and, I don't. and you'll realize that God has cleansed you. It's not about do's and don'ts. It's about having a pure heart before the Lord, and it's beautiful. So um, I, I know there's people who've gone through these traumatic experiences, and they've had a negative effect on you. You can't sh seem, to shake, uh, seem to shake it off. And for some people, even the devil's holding it against you over and over again. He's still trying to, he's tr still trying to cause you uh, shame. He's still trying to embarrass you because of those things. And really what needs to happen is just like with the Gadarene, I believe just like with me, uh, God will heal you of your traumatic experiences in the past, and that will, that will lead for you, to you being set free. Now, um, I just want to kind of finish up here. I'll try to get to this last part uh, briefly. Um, the demons inside the man asked for permission to go into the pigs that were nearby. And so Jesus gave them permission. So they left the man, entered the herds of pigs, the herd of pigs, and they rushed down a steep bank into a lake where they drowned. So the pigs drowned. So the demons left the man. Jesus told them to leave. And they asked to go into the pigs. Jesus said, go ahead. They rushed down this bank of a lake and they go into there and they drown. All the pigs drown. When they, enter, when they entered into the pigs, the pigs were driven to self-destruction, just like the man was uh, before Jesus got there. Remember, the man was hurting himself, doing self-destructive behavior, cutting himself, breaking the chains, gnawing and gnashing. Uh, he was being self-destructive. And now when the, when the demons left the man and went to the pigs, uh, the pigs were self-destructive, like the man was. So you see the common characteristic. Now, I've heard some people say, uh, that they have a problem with Jesus healing a man at the expense of pigs. There's actually been people who've said that. That they have a problem with Jesus healing this man at the expense of pigs. Now, I just, wanna, um, I just want to just, uh, just address that briefly. Obviously, obviously the man's soul... Was, is much more important and valuable to Jesus than a pig. Even a hundred pigs, even a thousand pigs, even two thousand pigs. Uh, uh, the man's soul was more valuable to Jesus, just like you and I. We are more valuable to Jesus. Than, there's no, there's no, no other thing in creation that is of more value to God than us, humanity. He, only us, only we were created in his image and he loves us with an unconditional love and we're more valuable than anything else in this world to him. Now, I know this story places a lot of emphasis on the effects of the demon on this man, but I don't, I don't want us to, to put all the emphasis there. Uh, the real emphasis is this. There was a man that had sunk into pretty much what we could call total depravity. He had gotten about as low as a human could get. But one day, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went out of his way to find this man where he was, where he was at, and Jesus set him free. That's where the real emphasis is. It's not, I don't, this shouldn't provoke us to ask more questions about demon and how can this happen and whether pigs are more valuable than people or, or that's not fair or whatever, uh, wanting to know more about the demonic. No, this isn't about that. This is about a man who was, had sunk in about as low as a person can get. But one day, Jesus went way out of his way. Jesus broke all the rules to find this man where he was at. And Jesus, in a brief encounter, set this man free forever without even any effort. There's a legion of, of, of demons inside of a man. Jesus goes there. The man falls at his feet. And in a brief encounter, Jesus, without much effort, takes authority over the demons and casts them out of the man. In, in an instant, the demons, the demons that were tormenting the man before Jesus got there were now tormented by Jesus. The second he stopped, stopped, uh, stepped out of the boat in, onto the land, the man falls at his feet and the, and the demons start saying, please don't torment us. Jesus, please don't torment us. So the demons that tormented the man were now tormented by Jesus. 
Because Jesus is the stronger man in this encounter. Jesus is the strong man now who lives inside of us, who protects us, who protects our body, protects our soul, protects our temple. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now Holy Spirit living inside of us. That's Christ in us now is the one who protects us. He's the greater. He's the stronger. He's the stronger man in the story that protects our temple. And so Jesus instantly does that. The, the demons tormented the man. When Jesus shows up, Jesus torments them and he takes authority instantly and sets the man free. Now, the, the, the herdsmen that were watching over the pigs, as soon as they saw the pigs run down and self-destruct and, and run into the lake, they ran and told everyone in the region and they spread the news real quickly. And then people came out from the town and they went and saw for themselves. And when they got there, what they find is this man who they, they had removed from society. He was naked, cutting himself, chained out by the tombs. He's homeless. He's tormented. They, when they get there, they saw that man that they knew in, to be in that condition. They saw him now at the feet of Jesus. And he's clothed and he, he's in his right mind. He is clothed at the feet of Jesus in his right mind. And this is where we end. That word right mind, I just want to end with that, that part right there. That right mind in the Greek literally means a sane mind or a, a sound mind, which it's at peace. It means uh, sober minded. It means you're safe in your mind. It's from the word, it's taken from the word sozo, which means to save, to deliver or protect, literally or figuratively, to heal, to preserve, or to be whole or to make whole. So what Jesus had done is he set him free, yes, but he also healed him. It, we read in the story that he was healed at, after this encounter. So he healed him. He healed his mind and he made him whole. Inside and out, he made this man whole. So this is a story of salvation. This is a story of liberation. This is a story of healing and restoration. Why? Because he was restored back to his community, restored back to his family, restored back as, as, a, as a part of humanity. And so let me just mention some things at the beginning of the story, at the end of the story. At the beginning of the story, a man had many demons. At the end of the story, the demons had gone from the man. At the beginning of the story, the man had worn no clothes. At the end of the story, after he encountered Jesus, he was clothed. He did not have a, live in a house, but by the tombs. Jesus told him, return to your home. He fell down before Jesus and shouted. He was sitting at the feet of Jesus at the end. The demons seized him and he was out of control. Afterwards, he was in his right mind. Luke says the man was healed in verse 36, and he uses sozo, which means he was holy. Jesus, he was wholly saved, meaning completely saved. Now, everything about him, this man wasn't going to have still some things lingering in his life. Jesus completely healed him. Sozo, he was wholly saved. And so as the story uh, ends, the offer, uh, the people of the town or the village around there where, the, where Jesus encountered this man, and where the pigs uh, ran into the lake, uh, Jesus, they reject Jesus. They ask him to leave. Despite the fact that what he, what he had done, he rescued this man. And so they rejected him. So Jesus departs. If, if, you, if you reject Jesus, then uh, he departs. So, but the healed man was different. The healed man asked Jesus. In fact, he begged Jesus if he could go with him. But Jesus said to him, he sends him home and he says, go declare how, how much God has done for you. He, he wanted to send him back to uh, his community, to his town and his family to be a living testimony of God's grace. So Jesus went there. So he, and the man did go back and he did tell everybody what Jesus had done and did tell everybody about God's grace. So Jesus went there. He went out of his way, went there just for that man. When Jesus found him, he was a demon-possessed man. When Jesus left him, he was an evangelist because that's what Jesus does. He, the man was restored to his community, and he was even given a commission to go share the good news of God's grace with everybody he knew. And so we see God turn around this man's life. 
We see Jesus come and have this power encounter of cosmic proportions. Jesus, without much effort, with, really without any effort, uh, sets this man free, and he heals him completely inside and out, heals his mind, heals his heart. He, he turns this man's life completely around, self-destructive, na naked, homeless, um, uh, chained, bound, and, and doing so many, uh, just completely had reached a, play, a low place, and Jesus comes and heals him completely, sets him free, and now this man's in his right mind and restored back to his community and family. And Jesus still does the same things today and di on different levels, so, and some, some like, like the story I described, there's some people in much worse conditions, some people in not as bad conditions, uh, but we've all in some way been affected because we, we've, uh, we live in a fallen world. Uh, we're still in, affected by sin. And so bad things happen, unfortunately, but when Jesus comes in, uh, he sets us free and he begins a process of healing in our lives. And he still does that today. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And I believe that one of the parts of this story that uh, we can can draw from is, oh, I think we all, or at least most, if not all, know somebody who's maybe really in a, in, a, in a bad place, in a low place, maybe been through some really traumatic things. You know, some people seem to go through more traumatic things than others. And so, but no matter how, how traumatized we are, no matter how low um, we've, we've gone because of the things that have happened to us, uh, maybe pr some people have been in prison, some people have been drug addicts. I know people who, who have overdosed several times before they knew Christ from heroin and other drugs, and yet God was able to reach them, restore them, and they, they've been serving God faithfully for, for many, many years now. It doesn't matter how low you go, what you've been involved in, uh, how bad you've been traumatized. Jesus still can reach you. He can save you. He can heal you. He can set you free. He can restore your life. He can restore anything. And whatever you're dealing with, um, Jesus can come in in a moment, take authority, and he can, he can uh, exert his power and turn your life around in a moment. Um, that's what happened to me. I'm dealing with generations of addiction when I come to Christ. It wasn't just me, something I picked up, uh, but it's something that was passed on, uh, something that was in the generations before me. And so, but he came in and he broke, he broke that off of me despite the fact that it was passed on to me. That's still my responsibility, my choices, I believe. Um, but I'm just saying, um, it, was, it didn't start with me. Uh, but I chose to continue it on uh, because I didn't know. I didn't know Christ. I didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't know anything different. But he stepped into my life. He set me free. And he did it for me. He did it for this gathering. He can do it for you or he can do it for somebody you know or somebody you love. And so he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still sets people free. He's still a deliverer. It's who he is. It's what he does. His blood still cries out for us uh, before the Father saying, I died for them. I shed my blood for them. Uh, I died so they could be saved. And not only does he want to heal us, but he wants to wholly heal us. He wants to completely heal us, heal our minds, heal our hearts. And really, w when the man was set free and he was healed, um, the beautiful thing is, is where, where was he? Where did they find him? At the feet of Jesus. When Jesus saves us, heals us, sets us free, where should we find ourselves? We should find ourselves at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him in a place of intimacy and gratitude and serving him. And so we can, we can there, from a humble position, look into his face seek his face and continue to love him and grow uh, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope you're blessed. Hope you're encouraged by uh, this miracle. I hope you're encouraged to know that the power of God is, is greater than any other power, that Jesus is the, is the, only, is the only one, uh, the only power, the power of God is the only power we should be uh, dealing with in any way. And just uh, be encouraged that it doesn't matter how low you go, how far anybody sinks, um, there's no place that the arm of the Lord can't reach to save, heal, and deliver us, set us free, make us into the man or woman, the person that God created us to be. Amen? Again, I pray you be blessed. Have a great rest of your evening, great rest of your week. Any guys, uh, any guys on there, any men watching, I want, I want to encourage you to join us on Zoom for the men's Bible study on the armor of God this Saturday. I'll be teaching on the shield of faith, so I encourage you to join in. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a great time. So 8 a.m. on Zoom. The flyer will be on Facebook Live. And so you just click on a link and you can go right in. And we'll be uh, continuing on our Bible study. And you can just join in. Even if you haven't been there or you missed, you can still join in. Also, uh, this Sunday, we will be in the parking lot again. And so we'll be having service in the parking lot. Uh, you, you can sit in your car. You can bring a chair, sit outside your car. And also we have a tent uh, that you can sit under as well. You can bring a chair. If you don't have a chair, we'll provide a chair for you. We'll disinfect it. 
and you, but I really encourage you, we got a big tent out there, and of course we social distance and all that, so you can sit with your family, and then another family will be seven feet away, and so on and so on, but I encourage you to come and participate, it's, it's a beautiful time, we're so grateful to see more people coming, uh, but we still, there's still more that haven't come yet, I want to encourage you, uh, even if you have to push yourself, I want to encourage you to come to the house of God, if you haven't been back to the house of God since the pandemic started, or it's been a super long time, I'm encouraging you, make your way and let it be a matter that you'll, whatever, whatever may be uh, keeping you from the house of God, uh, and if, you, if you're not ready or you're, you're concerned about uh, the virus or whatever, I understand that. But if you're just used to being online or, or just um, whatever kind of have not, you just kind of get gotten cold, spiritually cold in some way, um, I encourage you to just res- to overcome that, resist that uh, feeling to not come. And come to the house of God. You will be amongst God's people. You'll be hearing the word of God. It'll be coming right to you, right to you as we're joined together. There's power in the gathering. If you're okay with online, that's great. But there's still nothing can replace the gathering in the house of God. You will be blessed. You'll be uh, you'll you'll be in the presence and the glory of God. And I, I, I'm I'm sure God has something great for you. But just come to the house of God and watch what God. Uh, will do. He wants you back in this house. Let's not forsake the assembling of the saints, uh, Hebrews 10 says. And so I encourage you, I encourage you, I encourage you, come back to the house of God. We'd love to see you. Let's worship together and glorify his name. It's, it's time. It's time to come back to the house of God. And so I want to encourage you to come. God bless you. Have a great rest of your evening. See men on Saturday that can make it. See you on Sunday, God willing. And it's going to be a great time in the Lord. God bless you. I love you. Again, have a great rest of your evening and a great week in Jesus' name.